Uh, it's an honor to, uh, to uh, have the opportunity to share with you uh, about uh, innovations and automations in this uh, forum. Um, and thank you for Ben's uh, introduction. I'm the chairman of the Hong Kong Moen Dai Associations, but uh, I'm not an expert. Um, today we have a lot of uh, expertise actually sitting uh, on, on the panel. Um, there are professors, there are people in the industries in the, in the technical sense. I am just a business owner. Um, today, um, I would give you a different view of what I think as a business owner, as a business leader, of how to um, uh, bring innovations and uh, uh, automation to the companies, to the, especially in the Mo and Dai industries. And also in a sense of um, sharing a little bit about uh, our problems, uh, the challenges, and what could happen uh, when we encounter uh, automations and uh, I 4.0 in, in China especially. Uh, thirdly, I would uh, share with you my view of uh, what can be done in, uh, in a special uh, uh, Moendai Industries in Hong Kong, which is uh, Hong Kong led it. Uh, uh, more and die industries and how do we differentiate ourselves um, compared to the world of more and die industries um, so um, let's uh, get started as, as you can uh, as you listen this morning uh, you will hear a lot about digitization uh, in the world um, I'm sure um, everybody will have a phone today, I think 20 years ago, um, digitized um, economy hasn't touched us in, in our daily life. Uh, it has been in a computer wise of things and then now the computer is on our hand and sooner or later the computer will be on our glasses, the computer will be on our fingers and could be, um, sadly, could be implanted into our body. Um, so digitization is going to change the way we operate. I think the kids, if you will understand how our young people behave when they started to understand uh, the world, they, they started to uh, early age, they're in touch with the digital economy. Um, when we are running a manufacturing operations, if we're just running the way we do things, they will have a very hard time because uh, why your machine doesn't have uh, a control board. Why if I talk to the machines, it doesn't respond. So these will be the things that will happen in the future when we bring young people into uh, manufacturing operations. Uh, as you can see today, we have gone through a lot of uh, industrial revolutions. Um, uh, the third revolution is about computerized things. So anything about uh, computer um, information flow uh, robotics into the into the manufacturing industries um, the next wave that we will encounter is all these information will be shared within the organization flow and eventually be uh, an intelligence um, uh, mounted into the clouds uh, for um, for any robotics to operate a factory so this is the trend it's uh, you like it or not it's going to come um, what there's a there's a very famous person in uh, in New York. It's called David Rose. Uh, he wrote uh, a lot of books and talked a lot about the future of the economy. He says any company designed for the success of the 20th century is doomed to fail in the 21st century. The whole world of manufacturing is going to change, if you like it or not, um, and we have to adopt it. Um, how? Uh, we can share a little bit about our experience. One thing when you talk, when we talk about automations, the first thing you, you in your head is about robotics. And you think we're going to put the robots to replace the person. You can work 24 hours. Uh, it's cheaper. We, we calculate ROI. So a lot of the companies will start, as me as a, as a business owner, I look into all the robots that I invest into the return investments. 
very simple. Uh, how much, uh, how, how compared to the labor rates, how much it's going to get a return, and if we can work 24 hours, then how much we can save, the quality of goods improvement and the efficiencies, this is what we look. And by doing this, then you see the demands for robotics will increase dramatically. So in, in the early years, uh, you will see uh, industrial robots in 2014, we had about 800,000 robots in operations around the world. I think if you will understand, most of those robots are, are now into the uh, automotive industries uh, for the uh, customization of uh, cars. In the future, in 2020, from the International Federation of Robots report, uh, that there will be 2.6 million of industrial robots operating uh, in the world. So it will probably around quadruple uh, very easily. So we're now in 2017. I think we will be a, maybe a million half uh, uh, so in quantities. But as uh, from the statistics shows, China actually occupies one quarter of the demand for the world of robots. So every million robots, 250,000 robots will be in China. Uh, for China manufacturing. So this is the trend. If you understand how many robots you have, how many robots you're going to increase uh, in the end to match with the world, this is, will be a statistics to compare with. For us as an intelligent factories that we want to uh, develop, the future is not only about robots. So in the beginning, when we say automations, we bring in a lot of robots. But in, in my eyes, the soft side of, uh, of things is actually more important than the hard part of automation because everybody can buy a hard part. You can buy a Fanuc robots, you can find, find, buy a universal robots. You, you, typically, you buy everything that everybody can. So there's no differentiation between you and me in acquiring assets. Uh, there are sensors, there's all kinds of controls that you can buy from the market. But what differentiates you from the market is your soft skill. Because these are your experience that you're going to share with the software and to complete a job with the robots. So a lot of people were focusing a lot on our attentions into the hardware side of things. The software side is actually your intelligence. This is your future. This is your independence of of your how do you differentiate yourself from the world of competition because everybody is buying robots like it or not they are buying it we're buying it we're increasing our capacities reducing about labors the content of robots will be the same and then the costs of manufacturing will stay closer and closer and what differentiates us is the intellectual property and by doing this, uh, in, especially in the mo and dai industries, uh, we started in China as a workmanship type of industries. So uh, when, when I, for, for us, when, when, I started, when we started a business, we are just mold makers. We call ourselves mold makers. We can actually engrave our name on the mold. This is our mold. This, I designed it. I engineered it. I made it. This is mine. Right now, it's all machined. So when you were trying to automate a factory, understand how automation works, I tell a robot to do something, he will do exactly what I told him, hopefully. If I tell him the wrong thing to do, it will repeat itself in doing the wrong thing all over, over and over again. Meaning, if I have a lights out factory, I tell the, the robots or the machine to machine 100 parts for me. If I gave him the wrong information, the wrong information will duplicate itself for 100 times. When I wake up in the morning, I go to the factories, I got 100 bad parts. This is how it is. So by learning how to do automations in the mold and dye industries, the important part of it is to understand your workflow, understand to beef up your design and engineering capability. So for my companies, we spent years and years and years to transform the organization from a workshop-oriented master mold-making operation to a design engineering uh, brain-led organization. This is the main part of automation in the mold and dye industries. What we have done, we've made a huge transformation of structural change of moving experts into the design engineering stage. Because, as I said, if, I t if my design engineering was wrong, the robots will manufacturing everything wrong for us in a very effective way. 
So you can lose money very quickly, lose money very easily by giving them the wrong information. If you say, well, in my old days, I can machine something and I can hand polish it and rework on it. Yeah, you can do that. But you just wasted the entire robotics um, uh, support investments that you have put into the organization. It's like you're a Schumacher, you can ride, drive a Ferrari, but if you have uh, Chinese drivers who don't know how to drive a car, then you just uh, increase your total cost of operations and you'll be actually more incompetitive or uncompetitive in the industry than not automating. So the, the first thing in mind is to beef up to improve your design engineering capability. Second thing is about reorganizations. The whole structure of your organization will change. The design engineering will be the, the head. You're going to move all your experts in the areas. And then it's all about information flow. When it's all about information flow, that in the end, you will have a lot more IT people, software people, engineering, that is not usually in the company, that you'll be recruiting people that to transform the organizations. You'll be all about having your people to manage data, manage computer, not in the sense of working on that piece. And also you will have a lot of network. So if you want to automate things, or your, your software designs has to be connected to the machines. You have to understand what the, the machines are doing and sending the programs and connecting the, the computer part and, and the machine part together. And also your, um, your uh, factory will be uh, using codes, so RFIDs, to find your parts. You have to understand where your parts are located, how is it done, what process is it on right now, and you have to have a very good understanding. So these are the hardwares that you have to have. And in the end, your factory will have a lot of robots, and, in, and you have to train your people to manage robots. So in, in the past, you were managing the, the parts, now you're managing the robots to do the work for you. In the end, you will also have a lot of abundance of employees. Then you also have to cross-train them into different departments so that they will have a job in the end. They will also have an incentive to continue to work with you to uh, accelerate the automation uh, program within the organization. So these are also the software engineers and data analytics. So if you gather automations, you also have a lot of data. The information of data, you also have to have people to analyze the data to give you reports uh, of it before you start an AI. In automating a factories, one very important thing I said is the brain and also in, is the system. So you have to map up the whole entire workflow of your manufacturing operations. Like for Mo and Dai, you start with a business order, uh, a quote, uh, and then eventually you do a DFM. After DFM, you start Mo Design and Mo, Mo BOM, and then you will have the BOM. If there's any changes in there, you change the BOM and you loop back into the Mo Design, and you're all the way to design process, CAM, uh, parts machining to mode assemblies to to uh, inspection of the of the parts uh, if the parts are right and then it loops back if there's any any mistakes that you happen into the parts and then these are the flow process you have to go through to understand uh, how what is your procedures of working things so meaning that if you have something's wrong anything mistakes these are intelligence of how you work on a factory that eventually this information will flow back into your systems and understanding and improve on your work. If you don't have that, you can't do automation. This is, this, this is, the, this is a very important part of uh, pieces why you try to automate the factory. You have to understand the workflow. If you duplicate this workflow in a wrong manner, the entire system will break down. So, so this is, this is uh, a very important pieces. What we have done into automation is we've gone through a lot of things. Uh, I, just talked, I just told you a little bit about systemization. I created all these words, and that's also standardizations. So meaning that you have to standardize your work. So meaning that your electrodes or maybe your holders, the whole company has to use the same holders. The machines and machines have to have the same system, uh, the same standards. Calibrating, so you have to understand, if you run an automation, so you don't know the, how the machine will perform, that you, that you cannot run an automated factory it's because the things that come out, you have no prediction. So you have to calibrate all your machines. By calibrating all your machines, then you have to understand 
there are different machines who have different precisions. I have 10 CNC machines, 10 CNC machines may have different precisions. So it is your decisions whether you're gonna use um, a, a same system, so let's say I have five microns as a tolerance for, for CNC, let's say for example, or 10 microns. Do you set 10 microns as a tolerance? Because if, if not, you create a huge complication in your automation. So meaning that from design engineering, from how you're gonna move the, the, the parts into the machines, you have a huge amount of varieties. Meaning uh, oh, this machine can do five micron, this machine can only do seven microns. Then the whole system of putting work into the CNC machines will be a, a very difficult task. So in my company, we decided that we, have, we can only set in one tolerance. So this is the tolerance we can go, I can go on any machines. By that, we eliminate a few machines. So this is the things that you have to be aware of when you, when you start um, uh, automation. Calibration is one important part. Palletization is to ensure that you put your goods into, into the machines, that it fits in every machine the same way, that you actually move pallets so you know what the goods uh, are, what process the goods are, the, the inserts are, and how do you move it around, and where is it located, and you can track exactly where it's manufactured. And once that, that's made, and you go to another process, it will load into the same system in your organization. And that actually was a very difficult task for us, because we have a cumulative error into a palletization. So that's also one of the things that we've struggled a lot about palletization, uh, although it saved a lot of uh, time, it actually uh, reduced our uh, accuracy. So this is, this is a challenge for all of us when you go into automations you have to be aware of. If you, don't ca if you cannot calibrate each part um, uh, at one time, you actually save in a palletization in standardizations, you will lose some accuracy. How do you deal with it? How do you calculate, how do you maintain it? These are your decisions on how to automate. Sensorize, so we put sensorize in, in sensors in every piece of our, equip, uh, uh, our inserts so that we know the workflow. Uh, network ties, as I said, the machines has to be in the network of computer so you can actually transfer documents or transfer programs into the, the machines. Robotize, so meaning that you're gonna put robots in there once your systems are in place. And then data collection. So once you put the robots in, getting all the equipments done, getting all the machining work, then you already started to collect data. And after the data you collect it, then you analyze, and then eventually you will get a report. So these are the type of reports that I receive. Uh, one of my CTO is here, um, Nelson, who's creating all these. Um, so in the end, I have I have uh, MES systems, which I can I can I can get information about the entire factories running today. So I have, uh, uh, I have um, my uh, KPI reports in a daily basis. Uh, I have my SPC analysis of all the machines that I have. I have my real-time management reports for my dashboards on, on a daily basis that I can manage the operations, understanding how it's performing. Okay, so we've talked about all these data collections and getting informations. And the informations are very, very valuable. If you want to go automate and go on an AI operations, an automatic running of an operations, it's very important. I can take you an example of just purely on uh, CNC and electro uh, manufacturing. So you see from the top, we had a, in, when we design uh, our parts, we have to design electrodes. Uh, once we design electrodes, it has to be CNC, so we have to program it. So we have to set the tolerance of the electrode and how many electrodes that we want. So then we go on a CMM machines to, uh, CMM machines to uh, inspect the electrodes, and then we spark a road on the workpiece. And how we spark a road on the workpiece that we'll get all these information in programming. And then after we spark a road on the parts, then the parts will have a tolerance. So we can check the tolerance of this. And then eventually the workpiece, if there's anything wrong with the workpiece, then we will do a repair, so we will rework. And then we will measure again and then eventually go into the molding machines and check if the tolerance are correct. So these are the normal process of how we uh, c collect all these data. So there's a lot of uh, more collecting data, more inspection that is required to get information for us to run automations. 
So what is it used? So when we design a electro or, or a workpiece, so we design the areas which we need to inspect. So these are the programs, the tolerance required, and then also the electro tolerance required. So you will know where to inspect, which are the critical dimensions in here, that how many of these electrodes are needed. And eventually we, we will create a geometry of, uh, of the parts. Uh, with the workpiece and the electrodes, and then we have to run up where we're going to inspect. So we have to find out where we're going to inspect on the, on the uh, workpiece and where to inspect on the electrodes. And then eventually we have to have a program to set up where, uh, which uh, probe that is required to measure which area and there, if there's any interference. So these are the things that we, we uh, program and check, and eventually we generate a program for this um, for this uh, work piece. And this work piece will have our own uh, RFID. So the, our workshop people will have uh, RFID sensors. They will sense the, the work piece and will automatically draw a, um, uh, a program for machining and also for inspection. So after it's inspected, uh, we'll collect a database uh, and then it will go into our CMC, uh, a CMM program and we'll get a data and we'll have a generate a report for quality. And after we collect all these qualities, so we had a data mining and da data analysis, well, then all these analysis will, will find out whether we have issues on every, any areas. So if we have a CNC that we machined, we find out that there's a tolerance or so there's a dimension uh, problem, then we will know whether it is something wrong with the machine or one of the machine. Is there something wrong with our, our cutting tools, so it's, it's wear and tear. When do we need to replace it? When we will lose our accuracies? These are all information that will go into. Do we have a, a error into the holding systems that creates um, the, the, the tolerance issues? So all these information will, will, will gather and we have the intelligence to make improvements on every step. So, so if we know how to do this, and this information, now it's in our brain, so from our experience. So we know, oh, we, we made a mistake in here, oh, maybe I know we, we have to, the, the wear and tear of the tools, uh, the cutting tools are faster, um, so we have to change more often, or maybe we change the different tools. So this information will eventually become an AI, if you collect those data, and that's how you run an intelligent factory. So this is a typical example of how to do it. So it seems very difficult, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it, is, it is difficult. You're going to transform the entire company, changing it. There's a lot of work to do, and it requires a lot of money. Um, in, in building all these robots, getting the ERP systems in place, and all these to change into a, a, a smart factory. For us to understand if that's the case, the companies who has the most money and resources to do it will run a lot faster than us as an SME. So you will see a trend of these major end customers of us as a mold maker. They are starting their mold shop by, ourself, by themselves. It will be fully automated, fully intelligent running. As an SME, it will be very difficult to support them because they, their pricing and their efficiencies will go up dramatically, that if we don't invest, we will be behind. And it's a, it's a, it's a real fact, and it's going to be difficult. And how do we challenge it? And this is the money that we have. So we've been building small organizations. These are all the savings that we have, and we have to give it and to try to buy equipments that are very expensive. And how do we buy? Like, before we do this, we have to understand what do you want to be? Like, who do you want to be? What, what kind of factories do you, do you want to be? What kind of differentiations do I want? One, one, one thing that we do, it's, it's time. So I want to be faster than everyone. I want to be the market leader on time to market. That's one way of doing it. So you focus on doing things. I could be leaning out the factories. I, I, I just want to squeeze so that my pricing could go down so I can, I can do. Maybe I want 24-7. So I, I just want to run the operation so efficient that it runs 24-7 that I can save some costs. Or you, 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 you want your products to be, your modes to be very precise. That could be one way. 
because I know in some automation you lose actually you lose your precision. So you have to have a very very good vision and roadmap of who you want to be. One way of doing things as SME, especially in Hong Kong industries, we call leapfrog. It's you skip some areas that other people are doing, and then you jump ahead, maybe five years ahead of them, maybe ten years ahead of them. That's that's how China has been doing it. Do you still remember when we go to China, we want to buy something? I had a bag of one hundred dollar note. This is the old days when we have everything we buy. I have to have a suitcase of cash, and ring it. And I always ask the questions: Why China is not doing five hundred dollar notes? Why not a thousand dollar notes? It will solve the problem. Why do I have to do bring so much cash? And nothing has happened. And eventually, we pay. We chat pay. <laughs> It's disrupt the entire market. How do we, as a bank, to disrupt、uh, HSBC or a Standard Charter or the banking system in the world? We did something very different, very unique, and we've changed the way we operate、um, money transaction. We didn't go through a five hundred dollar notes and go through the problems with、uh, fake notes. We did it a jump. We call leapfrog. What I'm thinking of doing is why are we doing this? There's a, there's a lot of the bigger companies will have a lot of burden. So I become I I started to work as a bigger company. So I have a lot of uh, uh, hands tied. I have a lot of machines. I have a lot of equipments. I have to fully utilize it. Even if it's a three axis machines, I'm putting a robots on top of all these uh, uh, machines to actually run faster. But why I can see a five axis robots. Uh, Five-axis CNC machines are available in the market. If you would do this, you will eliminate、uh, a lot of polishing, eliminate a lot of time of electro, meaning that you actually have less CNC time、uh, on running electrons and spark the road on a part. You can actually finish a lot of things out of a five-axis machine. So in an SME. Idea is not to think too much about using existing old equipments and try to automate it, but to use the same, to use the idea to leapfrog into a technologies which you will actually go beyond what the other big companies are doing. So this is the idea. We've been talking about smart factory. Why not smart mold? What's wrong with our mold? Our mold is like a hundred years old. It has never changed. It's a little more precise. But the way we construct the tools, the tool itself, it's dumb, it's old-fashioned. And what if we just had a Xiaomi、uh, headband inside? You know how much the cost of a Xiaomi headband is? Seventy-nine RMB. What is the price of a sensor? It's very cheap. If I can sense the temperature of the mold, I can sense all kinds of exercise and movements of the mold. Whoa, that's. 10 RMB into a, a mold, you can actually tell a lot. What if you have a camera in there? If you make sure the parts that does fall off before you you close the mold, it's it's huge. It's, how much is a camera? My friends told me the iPhone five, iPhone six cameras is like less than 10 US dollars per module. What about a timer? What about a 4G?、Um, so you can track your molds. Why don't you have a like a monitoring systems of your mode? Like why do we leave? Why don't we leave Rocket and start to build a smarter mode? Why not a smart fact a smart machine? You know how much it costs of a CNC machines? Some of our modes could cost more than a CNC machines. Why don't you take care of your modes and why don't you make it smarter? And and in running、uh, a manufacturing operation, we talk about a, a lot about autonomous driving. In the end, everybody was thinking about how do I run a, a pickup trucks or a, a, a trucks like this to bring goods into the warehouse autonomously. All the big companies are trying to do this. Other people are thinking about what if I use autonomous driving and bring parts to me. So all the inserts, all the parts, all the all the um, um, uh, uh, cutting tools can be actually moved to us or moved to another department. When people were thinking about robots, we were thinking about, oh, do I find a 
a five-axis robots or do I find a two-handed robot or maybe I use a spider robots and there all the big companies are thinking maybe I buy 10 maybe I buy 20 what if my robots can move what, what if my robots can move from location to locations so I can better utilize my robots so these are the things that we need the industries to to work together into leapfrogging ourselves as a SME organization above what the, the bigger companies are trying to do, is think outside the box, think ahead of them. Um, how the machine makers and the mold makers in, in Hong Kong can collaborate and make something different. What if we have the robots with two hands with wheels? Another thing that's about uh, game changer. One thing is about uh, um, uh, laser sintering. It's a, it's, a, it's a different, so EOS It's going to talk about um, uh, laser sintering later today. I just saw the robots uh, the Hong Kong University uh, are developing. If they can do laser sintering in a very fast mode, that will change the entire way of mold making. What about uh, 3D printing of molds? Right now, it's, it's time to market. What if we just put the effort into um, uh, a material science into 3D printing of mold versus uh, investing into uh, uh, robotics, into uh, making our machines more efficient. This is a way of leapfrogging or changing the way um, um, how the mold making industries could work. This, this material can last for about 500 shots, a few hundred shots, and can be done in a night. You can switch off the lights tonight, you go to bed tomorrow, you have a mold. If I can change the material, if I can put more efforts in the material, if I can do a thousand parts, five thousand parts, it will change the entire way of mold making operates. I can send the files to anywhere around the world, they can build the molds at th the same night as I'm sleeping. And your factories will be like this, it will be 3D printed machines all over, and then and the lady in, in the middle, you can make it a robot. So you can just disrupt the entire world of um, mold making industries. You'll be the fastest, shortest lead time mold makers in the world. We'll call it, talk about sharing economy. So Uber has changed the way we operate. Our utilization of cars is 4% in the whole world. Do you, under, do you know how much uh, utilization of our CNC machines and EDM machines are? I would say probably in China, well, 30%, 40% if we count 24 hours. So what, what if we do a sharing economy of machines? But this is very disruptive. You know, the, the Taiwanese are doing it. The Taiwanese are very uh, like a sharing economy. Everybody has their own small shops and they're sharing it. If they start to disrupt the industries, what should we do? If we as a Hong Kong industries, if we have, let's say, for example, Makino to share machines for us, what if we have Siemens to share a software with us that we can utilize the machines, reduce our costs, and we can collaborate we can beat out the entire world of mold making. What about sharing of expertise? If I had a problem with my molds, what if I share uh, one of your guys, can, I, can you tell me how to design that? I had a little bit of problems. I'll pay you $10,000 to do it. It's an economy of, of sharing. You know what? This is happening. This is happening. This is the expert sharing platform of advice to all industries. It could be in manufacturing industry, technology industry, startups, legal, and so on. They can actually go to the website, open it, and we'll pop a video conference uh, with all the experts. It could be free or it could be paid. So these are the uh, experts that you can find in the industries. So you click on one industries, you find that guy, read their profile, check the calendar, you can talk to them. Simple as that. This is happening in the US. We are bringing, so the Federation of Hong Kong Industry is signing a contract with this organization to bring this uh, platform into Hong Kong. So you will see uh, your presentation, the guy who is an expert to share with you. They can also do conferences, webinar, into, uh, into teaching things um, uh, from, uh, from a world which is outside of Hong Kong. And these are the learning. So all our kids are actually learning like this. They go into an expert uh, learning platform. They will share software development. They will share how to do design, how to run a business. They can learn it themselves. This is the world of sharing economy that's coming to, the, to our world. It is coming. It is going to disrupt the way we operate. Virtual reality. This is also a technology that's available in the market. 
there, this is a this is a, a collaboration with Hololens, which is Microsoft and Autodesk. So you can actually see three desi designs. You can also do maintenance with uh, AR applications. You can actually use your glasses, look at something, and the experts on another factory or from Germany will be able to tell and teach you how to how to maintain the machines, how you're going to change the modes, how do you fix something. You can actually write on top. This is a collaboration with HoloLens Skype. It will change the way. You don't need a lot of expertise in all the factories. You can only have one. It will do the job. We can also do designs together. Uh, I will be sitting in Hong Kong, you'll be sitting in Germany. We wear the same glasses. We can, we can look at the design together. It's like next door to each other. This is the future, moving the world to a, to a closer environment. This is how we're going to work, maybe, in the future. Do you, does anybody know this sign? What is, what, is, what is it? Snapchat. So everybody was like, wow, HoloLens is very expensive. You want to buy it, it's a few uh, hundred thousand dollars or less. You know what Snapchat has done? This is what your kids will be wearing. This is a Snap Snapchat spectacle, just launched a few days ago. It sold for less than uh, 1,000 Hong Kong dollars. You can actually press on the glasses, you will take videos, you will see the same thing at the same time as anybody in your social media. It will come, meaning that you can actually can bring these devices and you can look at pro product designs together, you can actually do engineering together with, with people around the world. It's only less than a thousand Hong Kong. Everybody will be wearing it. It's like crazy. Everybody's, all the kids are chasing after this. If you don't do this, you'll be outdated. So people, uh, the kids that comes into your factory will teach you how to do things. And this is the way our future looks like. In conclusion, um, I think in, to prepare automation for, for our mobile industries, we have to think um, on restructuring the operations, changing from uh, workshop-oriented operations to a design engineering-led operations. And also, if you want as an SME, you cannot follow the big guys uh, in going the same path. You will be losing. You, they will be running much faster than you as an SME. You have to do something different to leapfrog into a, an area to go beyond what they can do. Third, it's a game changer. There's all kinds of technologies that are available. It's going to change the way we operate. If we can be a first mover, you will take the advantage and apply the latest technologies, VR technology, AR technologies, will, will enhance the way you operate your factory. Hope uh, this is something useful for you and um, uh, as, a, as a CEO and uh, um, talking about automations, I'm not an expert in uh, automations and robotics and uh, you will have some uh, big experts to come and I hope uh, you will go back and uh, rethink about how you operate your, operate, uh, your factory. Thank you very much. Thank you.